So I don't know if you are ever surfing the web and you come across some articles or some stuff that just kind of blows you away. It, it's like, wow, that is so amazing, so audacious. Uh, I did this past week as I was doing some research. Uh, for instance, in Indonesia, the uh, prime minister there, uh, Joko Widodo, uh, he is observing his uh, capital city, Jakarta, and he is seeing how it is so full of pollution, 30 million people. It is uh, sinking a foot a year. Uh, it is a disaster. So you know what his plan is? Is to entirely start a new capital 800 miles away. He, he's building a brand new capital, New Santerra, and this is going to be a, a green capital. So uh, transportation is going to be public transportation, walking or cycling. It's all going to be a green city, $50 billion city uh, from scratch, moving the capital over there. Audacious, like crazy. Uh, another one is, of course, Elon Musk and his uh, Hyperloop. Uh, there's about a dozen companies right now that are working on the Hyperloop. It's kind of this vacuum tube that has coaches where people ride in them. What blows me away is that if they can get this thing going, it's going to travel at 1,200 kilometers an hour. I mean, faster than air travel. It's going to be absolutely mind-blowing. But they, the one that really got my attention this week was the de-extinction uh, stuff that's happening around the woolly mammoth. There's a company called Colossal, and uh, these guys are working right now on resurrecting a 4,000-year-old gone extinct woolly mammoth, and they say that by 2028, they're going to have a real live woolly mammoth walking around in the Arctic tundra. <sighs> Like just mind blowing, right? And, and they're also working on on uh, resurrecting the Tasmanian tiger as well as the dodo bird. I mean, crazy stuff, right? But the reason this one really got my attention was because of question number twenty three in our Echoes Catechism in the Year, which our question this weekend is: What is regeneration? What is regeneration? Now, you might be going, I don't know, never heard of it before. It turns out it is a massive concept in the Bible. Now, we are studying this month all things about salvation. We've done a deep dive into what is repentance, what is justification. This weekend, what is uh, regeneration? And next weekend, I'm, I'm tagging off to Pastor Dunstan, who is going to be teaching us on what is sanctification as we wrap this section up. But today, we want to study what is what is regeneration? We're going to ask this first question. We're going to ask four questions. The first one is this, how, how important is regeneration? It might be a concept that you have not really thought of or heard of and never think of in regards to salvation, but it turns out that it is a massive concept in the Bible. Uh, if, in fact, humanity was a woolly mammoth, we had our extinction event in Genesis chapter 3 when sin entered the world. Humanity turned their back on God in doing so, they became spiritually dead, and they invited all sorts of craziness into our experience. If this was the human extinction event, uh, then we became spiritually dead, and we invited into the human experience greed and murder, depression, cancer, terrorism, poverty, divorce, war, oil spills, drone strikes, phone scams, addiction, discrimination, and the list goes on and on and on. All that stuff came in the third chapter of the Bible. When we invited all this in, when we turned our back on God, it was our moment of spiritual death. Well, throughout the Old Testament, God hints at and gives us pictures of being resurrected from the dead to life. Now, let me show you. For instance, in Genesis chapter 6, Noah and his family are facing an extinction event with the flood, and God resurrects them and saves them in the ark. It's a prototype of what he's going to be doing. In Genesis chapter 22, uh, God gives Isaac, who is about to be sacrificed, uh, a resurrected life by providing a ram as a sacrifice instead. In the second book of the Old Testament, uh, the Israelites are faced with two extinction events. One is they're in slavery in Egypt, and God provides a sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb, uh, to resurrect them and save them from, from certain death. And then they go through the Red Sea, and they are resurrected on the other side while the Egyptian army is all drowned, and they have this death-to-life experience. This goes on and on. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, we read this. I love this verse. Listen to this. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your, your stony, stubborn heart, and will give you a tender, responsive heart. 
thousands of years before the first human heart transplant was ever being produced, God was talking about doing a spiritual heart transplant, about taking the dead stony heart and resurrecting it to life. And then just a chapter later, we have this incredible chapter in Ezekiel chapter 37. We won't read it, but I want to tell you about it real quick. Uh, Ezekiel is brought to a valley of dry bones. It's just a, a, a valley of skeletons. And God says, prophesy to the skeletons and tell them to come back to life. And so he does. He prophesies to them. And there's a rattling of bones. And they're all joining. And they join one another until they come up to a skeleton. And then God puts flesh and, and sinew and bones and skin onto these. But they still don't have any breath. And so Ezekiel says, but they, they're not breathing. And God says, well, prophesy to them that they would breathe. And the wind of God comes. And they are brought to life. And it, the last line says, they're brought to life like a massive army. And this is a picture of what God is going to do. This is 600 years before Jesus even comes. It's a picture of what God is going to do. I mean, forget about the woolly mammoth reproduction bioengineered from Asian elephants. I mean, this is incredible what God is promising. And then we move into the New Testament. And we find out that this idea of regeneration is a big deal in the New Testament. And now it's beginning to come fulfilled. And Jesus is the first one to spill the beans and he does it with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. In fact, it's a little bit of a longer chapter, but we're going to read this because this is going to be our anchor text for today. John 3, join me here. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to Jesus to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again... You cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one will enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. How are these things possible, Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses li was lifted, lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in Him will have eternal life. And then catch this. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son to the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. For some of us, as you heard that phrase, born again, you tripped a little bit. You might have had a little bit of a, an emotional reaction. Maybe it was a bit of confusion. Maybe it was a bit of aversion. Maybe it was some discomfort. Maybe it was resistance. Maybe it was even embarrassment. And that's completely understandable because of what has happened to the term born again in our current culture. We most often hear it in reference to born again Christians, giving us the idea that there's some category called born again Christians as if there's something called non-born again Christians. But, but that's just confusing. I mean, are there non-born again Christians? How does that work? Sometimes we hear it referenced uh, in meaning somebody who's outspoken or fanatical or a radical Christian. They're a born-again Christian. They're a radical Christian. Uh, sometimes it's meant to distinguish between denominations or maybe style of church. Most often we hear it these days in reference uh, to right-wing fundamentalist conservatives uh, kind of giving it a whole political overtone. So if you have some aversion or you haven't said the words born again lately or you haven't heard anybody say the words born again lately and you're kind of embarrassed by the term, it's completely understandable. And yet I'm not overstating the point when I tell you that the entire Bible is all about this regeneration thing. From beginning to end, the whole thing is about this being born again, this being brought from death to life. 
How big of a deal is this? How important is regeneration? It is a massive and powerful concept in the Scriptures that many of us have not given much thought to. Question number two, what is regeneration? Well, in order to answer this, we really need to kind of go over the text a little bit more. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to Jesus and said to Jesus, Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miracles, your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. To understand this passage, we need to know a little bit more about this guy named Nicodemus. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Uh, the word Pharisee mean, means set apart. He was an isolationist. He was, he was not going to have a common life. He was not going to do what everybody else did. He was not going to hang around with common people. He's a religious authority. He, his voice has a lot of weight in the culture with the common people. When he says something, they believe him. He is a, an authority. However, we know that Nicodemus is not only a Pharisee, but he's part of the Sanhedrin, which is the supreme court of of Israel. So he is an elite. He is wealthy. He is respected. He is famous. He is a five-star Jew. He's a PhD in in Old Testament uh, scholarship. He's a super religious person. He's a religious superstar. And everything he says, people are believing. And if there's anybody in this culture who is right with God, it's Nicodemus. Everybody sees him as the authority, and and he is the pinnacle of being right with God. And yet Nicodemus is stalking Jesus late at night. Why? Because he wants to be away from curious, gossipy people. He wants to check Jesus out on the side. He, He has everything in life. He's famous. He's respected. He has power. He's wealthy. And yet he's dissatisfied with life. And so he comes to Jesus asking Jesus some questions. Well, he's about to ask Jesus questions in this private interview, but it's, it's fascinating. He's just warming up the conversation. He's just buttering Jesus up a little bit. He's just kind of warming things up, uh, kind of flattering Jesus a little bit. We all know you're from God. Your miraculous signs are, are enough. And Jesus will have none of it. He cuts right to the point. And he says, it says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. In one sentence, Jesus pulls the carpet out from under Nicodemus. Everything that Nicodemus stood for and stood on has just been pulled out. And he tells Nicodemus, there's no way you are going to enter the kingdom of God unless you are regenerated, unless you are born again, which short circuits everything in Nicodemus's mind. You see, the Pharisees, not only were they the Jewish authorities, But they taught everybody that that everybody that was a Jew was automatically destined for heaven because they were descendants of Abraham. In fact, many Pharisees taught that Abraham himself had parked himself at the gates of hell to make sure that no Jews accidentally wandered in because they were all destined for heaven. This was the mindset that, that, that Nicodemus came to this conversation with, and Jesus throws Nicodemus a screaming curveball. Nicodemus, there is no entering the kingdom of heaven without being born again. And Nicodemus is confused. What, what, what do you mean, explained Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and a spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to the spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. This phrase born again is made up of two Greek words, geneho and othen. Geneho kind of almost ha- has a sound of Genesis, and it, in fact, it comes from that, Genesis, beginning, the beginning, the, the birth. Uh, anothin means again, or it can also mean from above. And Jewish scholars believe that Jesus was actually using it in both ways. You need to be born again from above. You need to be born again from above. Nicodemus, physical birth will give you a place on earth. But you need spiritual birth, which will give you a place in heaven. It is not enough to be born once here below. You need to be born again from above. You need to know 
this heart transplant that God does. You need to know this regeneration, this being brought back to life, being transformed from death to life. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, your idea of salvation is inadequate. You've got it all wrong. You, you don't truly understand the salvation thing. Jesus is saying, you are one of the most religious people I know. You are one of the most religious people in this nation, and yet you have got it wrong. Your rules and your religion will not get you to heaven. You must be born again from above. You know, over these three weeks of teaching out salvation in our Echoes Catechism series, I've particularly enjoyed overwhelming you with Scripture. Uh, we, we kind of experienced it, first of all, in the repentance. Many of us had not thought of repentance for a long time. In fact, we might have said, well, yeah, maybe the Bible mentions it a couple of times, and I overwhelmed you with all the places that you had missed. We did it with justification last weekend. But most of us would go, I, I don't know what justification is. I don't, did I ever read about it? And then I showed you all the places. Well, I, I want to do that again. I want to admittedly, just overwhelm you with all the places that talk about this new life and this rebirth uh, that you probably have read, but maybe you didn't connect the points, the, the, the dots here. Let's go. Fasten your seatbelt. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come, Romans 6, 5 to 6. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. Our old selves were crucified with Christ. We are no longer slaves to sin. Ephesians 2, 5. Then even though we were dead because of our sin, he gave us life when, we raised, when he raised Christ from the dead. Colossians 2, 13. You were dead because of your sin and because of your sinful nature and not yet cut, had not yet been cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ when He forgave your sins. Titus 3, 5. He saved us not because of the works that we had done by our own righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of, look at that, it's right there in the Scripture, regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 1, 23. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living Word of God. The last one, 1 John 5, 4. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. What I want you to notice is that, first of all, this born-again regeneration, new creation thing is all over the Bible. From beginning to end, it is a major theme. Secondly, I want you to notice that whatever this being born again thing is, it is radical. It is as shocking as a corpse or a bunch of skeletal parts laying in a valley being raised up to new life. That's how radically different from dead to alive, from extinct for 4,000 years to walking in the Arctic tundra. That's how radical this is, which leads us to a third question. How does regeneration happen? Now, I wish you wouldn't have asked that question, and in a minute you're going to wish you hadn't have asked that question because it's complicated, or shall I say we have made it complicated. I tried. I, I tried. Believe me, I tried to spare us. But I realize there is no teaching and answering, answering this question of how does regeneration happen without diving into, brace yourselves, Calvinism versus Arminianism. Yes, hang on to the person next to you because it's going to get bumpy. John Calvin was born in 1509 in France. And he became a central figure in the Reformation. The Reformation was, there was, before this time, there was one church, the Roman Catholic Church. There was just one church. And these people rose up and said, we think you're getting it wrong. We need to get the Word of God into the hands of people, not just priests. And we need to be preaching Jesus' as salvation, faith in Christ's as salvation, not based on our works. So they became part of the Reformation. And John Calvin summed up his theology, his opposition to this, this, uh, this church in, in an acronym called TULIP. This is where it gets kind of deep dive, okay? So here we go, real quick. Total depravity. Every part of the human condition is corrupted by sin, he taught. In fact, you can't even turn to God because you're so corrupted, you couldn't even say, God, I need you. You're so corrupted. The second one is unconditional election. 
God has selected certain people for salvation, uh, predestined them, elected them before the beginning of time. So this means that these people are the chosen ones. Uh, L is limited atonement. Christ didn't die for everybody. He died for the elect that He predetermined would come to Him. You, being a Christian, are presumably part of the elect. I, irresistible grace. God is all-powerful, and the elected cannot resist God. God has chosen them, and His grace is irresistible. And then the P is perseverance of the saints, which means that eternal salvation is secure, and somebody who is elected and comes to this Christ with this irresistible grace cannot uh, lose their salvation. Well, a hundred years later, and obviously I'm just skimming over the surface of this, a hundred years later, a Dutch theologian named Jacobus Arminius uh, was a devoted Calvinist until he started looking into it deeper, and he had some opposition to what Calvin was teaching. So he didn't have a nice acronym like Calvin did, but he opposed uh, every part of the tulip uh, one line at a time. So Arminius read the same Bible as Calvin, but he could not wrap around his mind around a God who pre-selected who would become part of his family and sent the others to uh, eternal destruction. So Arminius replaced total depravity with human free will, meaning that humans now have the opportunity to choose whether they will reject or accept Christ. Arminius replaced unconditional election with conditional election, meaning that God doesn't choose or predestine people to be saved, but He knows in advance who will be saved. So God didn't, pre- didn't select you, He said, but God knew that you were going to come to Him. And so this is sort of uh, His explanation of some of these passages. He replaced the uh, limited atonement with general atonement, meaning that Christ died for everybody, every human being, but everybody now has the opportunity to reject or accept Him. He replaced irresistible grace with resistible grace, meaning that you have free will. You can accept Christ or reject Christ. And he replaced perseverance of the saints, which was eternal security, with uncertainty of perseverance, meaning that you need to continue in your relationship with Christ in order to be saved. So why does any of this matter? Everything regarding the answering of the question, how does regeneration happen, is based on one of these two theological perspectives. Calvinism and Arminianism are two giant theological concepts that have been battling out for 500 years. And so if you are of the Calvinist persuasion, uh, you would point to God's power and to man's depravity. And you would use an illustration like this. You'd say, when Jesus said, you must be born again, does a baby have anything to do with that process? Does a baby have anything to do with deciding whether they're going to be born or not? Does a dead body have anything to do with deciding whether they're going to be resurrected or not? Calvinists would say, same in salvation. You had, your total depravity means you had nothing to do with the process of being born again. It was all God's initiative. Now, if you're of the Arminius uh, pers- persuasion, you'll say, you, you'll say, and focus on God's love. And you'll say, God loves us so much that He gave us free will And He died for everybody, but He uh, allows us to decide whether we are going to repent and receive and believe and be part of the process of regeneration. So, who's right? Well, after 500 years of debate, I'm not about to settle that uh, in any way. In fact, I don't know. And I don't even pay all that much attention to this stuff. And the reason being that that I simply hear a call in Scripture, whether you're a Calvinist or Arminius, you cannot get away from the call of Jesus to be fishers of men. You cannot get away from the call of Jesus to go and make disciples. You cannot get away from the call of Jesus to repent, believe, and receive. You cannot get away from what Peter says to always be ready to give a reason for your hope. You can't get away from what John says, which is to confess your sins. You can't get away from Psalm 2 and what David says. In Psalm 2, there's this fantastic picture of a conquering king who has conquered another king. And the question is, what will the conquered king do? And in Psalm 2, David's encouragement to the conquered king is to come before the conquering all-powerful king, to kneel down, to lay down your crown, and to kiss the feet of the conquering king and pledge to serve him with your whole life. And David is not really talking about kings, he's talking about us. He's saying, will you submit 
to the all-powerful God? Will you lay down your crowns? Will you kneel, kneel before him? Will you kiss his feet and serve him and allow him to be the God who brings you back to life? I believe that when we believe, when we receive, when we confess, when we kneel, when we lay down our crowns, when we cry out for salvation like Jonah did in the belly of a fish, that God actually saves us. He regenerates us. He gives us new birth and gives us new life. But what you need to realize is this is not just simply a renovation job. This is not simply a reforming or a learning some new habits or, or, or tweaking your life or changing the course a little bit or a little bit of improvement or modeling, remodeling or upgrading. This is a, a replacement of your heart. This is a heart transplant, taking the heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh. There's an old fable about a king many years ago who had a court, and in his court were two nobles who were constantly bickering. They were always fighting, and they were always fighting about one thing, and they were always arguing about can a person, can a gentleman be trained, or do you have to be born into being a gentleman? They're constantly fighting about this, and so the king finally had had enough, and he said, listen, you two, stop it. I'm sending you out, go into the world, find your evidence to prove your point, come back one year from today, and then, and then show me your evidence, and we'll decide. Can a gentleman be trained and be, be brought up, or, or do you have to be born that way? And so the two men went out in search of evidence for their particular view, and they both found themselves a long ways away from the kingdom. And the, the year went very quickly, and the nobleman that believed that a, a, a person could be trained into being a gentleman had no evidence at all. One day he's sitting in an outdoor cafe and he is just despondent. He knows that in, in about a week or two he has to go and give evidence. He's got nothing. And so he's kind of sulking a little bit and he orders a coffee and then he sees the most amazing thing. The innkeeper sends out a cat and the cat is dressed in a server outfit standing on its hind legs holding a tray of coffee and is waddling towards the, towards the man. And the, the cat successfully serves the man his coffee. And he goes, oh my goodness, there's my evidence right there. If, if you can train a cat to do something so unnatural as to serve coffee dressed in an outfit, then certainly, certainly you can train a man to be a gentleman. So he, he pays a ridiculous price for the cat. He takes the cat, and he's on his way back to the kingdom. Well, the other man who was going to argue that you had to be born a gentleman, that you had to have it in you, he had nothing. The day before, he's going back to the city of the king. His head is hung low. He's depressed. He knows he's going to lose this challenge. He's walking into town, and he looks into a shop window and sees something. He stares for a minute, and a smile breaks across his face. He goes in and makes a purchase, keeps it secret, he comes back to the, the, uh, the king because the word had leaked out that the, the first man had, had found his solution and what his solution was. And, and so the first man comes and he's got his cat and, and he's, he's dressed in a special garb for the royal court. He's up in his hind legs. He's got his tray. He's got his coffee. And he comes down the red carpet flawlessly. And the king is so impressed. Everybody's so impressed. And, and the cat managed to serve the king his coffee. And, and, and the entire court just breaks out in applause. Everybody knows this man has won his, his challenge. He has made his point that, that you can be trained. And he stands up and gives his little oratory uh, about how uh, if, a, if a cat can be trained to do something so unnatural, certainly a man can be trained to be a gentleman. And, and so the king then looks at the other man with a little bit of pity, knowing that he had lost, and says, go ahead. And the second man comes and he kneels before the king with a small box. As he's kneeling, he opens the box and six white mice come running out of the box and the cat goes ballistic. The cat throws the tray up in the air. The coffee goes spilling. He forgets all his training, all his manners, everything he's learned, and he goes with a crazed look on his face after these mice. And the man simply stands and realizes he has won the challenge. Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, you can't just retrain. You can't be religious enough. You can't follow enough rules. 
because eventually one day the timing and the circumstances will be right when your true heart will come out. You need to be born again. You need a heart transplant. So, last question. What practical difference does regeneration make? This is possibly the most important question anybody could ever ask themselves. And it's very simple. Have I been born again? Has what Jesus is talking about and the entire scriptures talk about, has it happened in my life? Have I had a heart transplant? Have I been regenerated by the power of the Spirit? It's actually quite an easy question to answer. All you have to ask is one more question. Who do you look like? A couple of weeks ago, Carolyn and I let you know that we became first-time grandparents of a beautiful baby named Judah. We have been having so much fun with this kid. People told us that being grandparents was awesome. I mean, I didn't know how awesome it was. But we have been asked one question over and over and over again, and I've heard other people asking Amy and James this question. Who does he look like? Now, obviously, he looks most like me. But aside from that, we know that children, when they come out, they look like their parents. Does he look most like Amy or most like James? Well, time will tell. But for you, if you have been regenerated, if you've been born again, the question is, do you look like your father? If you have been born of God, do you look like Him? Do you talk like Him? Do you live like Him? Do you look like your Father? Do you have the same characteristics? Or have you just learned some new tricks? So what is regeneration? Regeneration is a heart transplant that converts a person from spiritual death to spiritual life. Regeneration is God's priority as He restores humanity and creation to its intended purpose and function. Regeneration is God breathing new life into dry bones. Jesus called this regeneration process being born again, indicating a radical transformation initiated by God's grace and received through faith. The entire message is when you are born again, you are regenerated and all things become new.